Hey, y'all. What's up? I hope everyone's having a good day. I uh, am excited to see you here. And uh, I hope you've been able to be here throughout this series to hear what everyone's been talking about. We've been doing an exegetical study of Philippians. And so what that means is, is that different preachers in our team will have a different chapter and a different set of verses every week. So we go from 1-1 one, one all the way to 423. And I'm coming up at the tail end trying to tie it all together with 4, 10 to 23. So before I get started on talking about everything or anything, I'd just like to go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. So let's do that. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. We thank you for this day and all the blessings that you've given to us. And Father, I thank you for this series that, that has been preached. God, it has been powerful and practical and timely messages. Messages about turning around and, and, and praising you no matter the circumstances. About not comparing ourselves to others. About keeping our eyes on you in difficult situations. About not looking only at ourselves but putting the interest of others before our own. So God, I pray that each and every single thing that we've heard, I pray that it would enter our heart. That we would take it to heart and that we would live that out. Because if all we ever do is hear it and take it in and we never do it, then what, what's the point? It's just knowledge. It's just information. So I just pray that, that these messages and that this message today would, would transform us and to make us to look more like you. We love you and praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <clears throat> so as I said, I have the very last passage of Philippians. It is Philippians 4, 10 to 23. Philippians 4, 10 to 23. It is the last little section of Philippians. And Paul is just kind of saying his goodbyes and some last minute instructions for the people at Philippi. Now, I just want to go ahead and let you know that verses 14 to verses 23, I'm going to read them in just a minute. I'm not going to spend a ton of time spent on those today because this is just kind of Paul saying his goodbyes. He's saying his, his last little things. So we're going to read it, and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about these verses and then get into the actual meat of what I want to say to you this morning. Does that sound good? All right, so we'll start in Philippians 4, starting in verse 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Verse 14, yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I am looking for a gift, but I am looking for what may be credited to your account. I have received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied. Now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, they are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. To God our Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet all the saints in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me send greetings. All the saints send you greetings. Especially those who belong to Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. So you see verses 14 to 23, Paul is talking about this thing where he's saying that there weren't any churches sharing with me in the matters of giving and receiving except you. So I'm going to explain that a little bit and give you a little context of what he means. Paul would go on these missionary journeys where he would go to different places and he would preach the gospel and he would establish churches and then disciple up leaders to place as the head of those churches. So when he's saying that sharing in the matter of giving and receiving, he's talking about financial aid. That the Philippians and, and other churches at, at different points 
were sharing with him and helping him to continue to go on these missionary journeys by giving him, giving him money. So he's saying in this passage that, well, there was no one doing that except for you, and I thank you for that. Not, not because you're giving me gifts, but because God's going to bless you for that. And so even though this is valuable material, it's, it's very valuable for your life, I'm not going to spend too much time on it because the very end he's just saying his goodbyes and giving greetings. And in, in verses 14 to 19, he's just talking about some history that he shares with the Philippians in this giving and receiving. And for a while, no one was giving to Paul. They weren't able to. And he talks about that in 10, 13, 10 through 13. And that's mainly what we're going to focus on. But that's why I'm not going to go into incredible detail on 14 to 23. So we're going to spend most of our time in Philippians chapter 4, 10 to 13. And I want to read that one more time just to refresh you on. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. So what he's saying is, is that none of these churches were sharing with him in the matter of giving and receiving. So he's saying, but at last you renewed your concern for me. They started giving to him again. And Michael talked about, in my passage, talks about Epaphroditus. And that is who the Philippians sent to Paul to give him these monetary gifts. And we know in 14 to 23, he says, I'm amply supplied. I'm paid in full and all my needs are met. So Paul is, is rejoicing in God because the Philippians are now giving to him again. They're sending him money again. They're sending him gifts again. And he says, before, you wanted to give, but you had no opportunity to show it. Now, I read through a couple commentaries on this, and no one really seems to know exactly why the church at Philippi couldn't share with Paul in giving and receiving. Some say that it was because in Acts when people were accusing Paul of, of just taking their money and just mooching off of them, that Paul said, all right, all churches, quit giving to me. Just stop for right now. Just, I don't want to do it right now. You know, just stop giving to me. What I want you to do is the, any money that you give to me, I'm going to take to Jewish Christians in Rome. I believe it was in Rome. If I'm wrong, sorry. I believe it was in Rome. He said, I want to take this offering to the Christians in Rome. So I'm not going to keep it for myself. I'm not going to keep any aid for myself. It's not going to me. I'm going to take it to other people who need it. That's what some people say, that Paul is asking them, don't give to me right now because I don't want to give off the impression that I'm in this for the money and that I'm in, that's what I'm in this for. And then some say all sorts of things that the Philippians were poor and they couldn't do it or they were persecuted and weren't able to send that money or nobody was healthy enough or ready enough or able to make the journey to take Paul this money and these gifts that they were wanting to give him. So that's what he's saying in verse 10 when he's like, hey, I'm so thankful in God that, that you've renewed your concern for me and I, I know that you wanted to, but I recognize that you couldn't. So that's what he's saying. We may not know exactly why they couldn't, but we do know now that they have renewed this relationship of giving and receiving with Paul. Verse 11. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through Him who gives me strength. I can do everything through Him who gives me strength. That's a pretty popular verse, isn't it? I mean, I mean, a lot of us, even if you didn't grow up in church and maybe you don't know the Lord today, and if so, that's all right, you're in the right place. But you've probably heard people quote this verse a lot, right? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We hear it all the time. It's all over people's t-shirts, walking around on, on Southeastern's campus. I mean, you, you see it all over the place, you know, on the back of their shirts, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things. And I was also reading in, a, in another commentary during my study that said that this verse is one of the most misinterpreted verses in the entire scripture. They said people misquote this, they misinterpret it, they misunderstand it constantly. This verse is not saying that you can do anything through Christ because he's going to give you strength. 
That's not what this verse is communicating. Now, I'm not saying that's false, because God will give you the strength. But that is not what Philippians 4.13 is saying. Because you have to read the verses before it and after it to really understand what verse 13 is saying. Verse 13 is saying that the secret to be content that verse 12 talks about is God strengthening Paul. And so in, in my three points for you today, my first one is this. If you want to learn the secret to be content, then realize that God's strength in you is what causes you to do it. God's strength in you is what causes you to do it. That word strengthens in verse 13, if you look it up in the Greek, it means a transfer of strength. A transfer of strength. So what Paul is saying is he's not saying, I can do all things through Christ because I'm strong enough. Or because I can do this. Or because I have it within me to do this. No, he's saying, I can do all things through Christ because he gives me the strength to be able to do it. When I was younger, I had a trampoline. And it wasn't one of those terrible trampolines that little kids have nowadays that have the nets around the outside, right? I didn't have that when you were growing up. Did anybody else have that? The nets around the trampoline? Did you? Oh, I thought you shook your head yes. I was like, no, calf, no. <laughs> no, we didn't have that. That's a safeguard, man. You can't, you can't put those nets up on the trampoline. <laughs> You gotta leave it open. That's what makes it dangerous. That's what makes it fun. You get a little too off balance because your head's a little too big when you're younger. You get a little off balance, you're falling off the side of that thing. My sister actually broke her arm on the trampoline. It's hilarious. I love her though. <laughs> I had a trampoline, I absolutely loved it. I also had this type of trampoline that right in the center of the trampoline, there was the little dotted white line circle. Anybody have that? It was a little circle right in the middle of the trampoline and it was the dotted line. And so this was the place that if you jumped on this spot on the trampoline, it supposedly launched you higher than any other place on the trampoline. It was the center point, it was the base, it was the strongest part of the trampoline. And so if you jump on that spot, it would shoot you higher than any other place. And trust me, I tried it out. I jumped all over that thing. And you know what, it did shoot me higher because I got, I got to the center. I was launched higher, I could go further when I got down to the center. What is your center? What are you trying to launch off of? What is your base of operation? Where do you go back to? Where are you trying to launch from? Where's your launching pad? Because the Bible says that Jesus wants to be that for you. That if you want to be content, if that's, where you're st if that's where you want to go, if that's your end goal, if that's where you want to press on to, like Cody was saying, if that's a goal that you have for your life, then the strength of Christ is the way that you're going to get there. See, we have to get back to the center. Paul knew where his center was, and it was the strength of Jesus in his life. Point number two, if we want to be content, if we want to learn this secret of contentment, that Paul is talking about. We have to realize this. That his strength breeds in us the confidence for contentment. So we also have to know that it is it, that is his strength in us that launches us further. And it launches us towards the goal that we have. But also his strength in you should give you the confidence in him to be able to be content. Why? Because I know that no matter what I go through in life. No matter where I am, no matter what my goal is, the strength of God is going to get me there. So we have to be confident in that. Trust does not come without trepidation. Trust does not come without trepidation. So if I never faced anything difficult, I wouldn't know what it means to trust in God. You're going to go through difficult things. You're going to have difficult circumstances but we have to realize that we are going to depend on God to get us where we need to go. <clears throat> that word contentment means this. Self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency. Now you might be thinking, now wait a minute. I was listening to what you're saying up there. And you told me that in verse 13 that 
God gives Paul the strength to do what he needs to do and to be content. But now you're, con you're telling me that what contentment is, is self-sufficiency. That don't make no sense. Here's what I'm telling you. The strength of God in you and the self-sufficiency that you have comes from your Christ-sufficiency. Your self-sufficiency is birthed out of your Christ-sufficiency. Your independence from the circumstances that are around you and the strength that you have to get through it comes from your dependence on God. Your independence and self-sufficiency comes from your dependence on God. Does that make sense? So that's what he's saying when he's saying contentment. He's not saying that I'm self-sufficient because I can do it and I have it within myself. He's saying, no, I'm self-sufficient because I depend on the strength of God. I can be content no matter what I face, no matter what circumstance I go through. And remember, he's writing this from jail, so he's in a tight spot for sure. He's saying, whatever I go through, wherever I am, whatever's going wrong, God's strength in me will allow me to be content, will get me through, will help me to push past the situation. Contentment is a byproduct of trusting in God. Contentment is a byproduct of trusting in God. Now this may be a little hard to swallow, and I'm not saying this because I'm trying to put the smack down on you. I'm just saying that this is the reality. When we are not content with where we are in life, it's because we don't trust God. When we let the circumstances that we're in dictate how we feel, dictate our praise, dictate our goals, dictate where we're heading, it's because we're not trusting and relying on the strength of God. Now that's for all of us. I'm not telling you that because I don't deal with it, because I do. We all have to have a daily reminder to really trust and rely on the strength of God to allow us to be content wherever we are and wherever we go in whatever we do. My freshman year at Southeastern, I had went through the first semester and it was awesome. I loved this place. I met people like Christian Santiago that made me want to leave, but I stayed anyway. No, I'm, kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Met all these awesome people, met all these awesome professors, and I, I wanted to stay here. I, I wanted to spend my four years here because I loved it. I absolutely love this place. Still do. And financial aid calls, and you know that's never good. Financial aid rarely ever has anything good to say. I've learned that. I've learned that. But we can still be content, right? So financial aid calls, and they're like, hey, Tyler, um, you owe $10,000. I'm like, excuse me, Mom? Mom, I need you to take the phone. Take the phone. Somebody's on the phone for you. They're wanting to talk to you. Tyler, you owe $10,000. You can't come back this next semester. I was heartbroken. Now, I'm not trying to say that this is the worst thing in the world because people, even right now, and, and you are, you might be, go through more difficult times than that. So I'm not trying to make light of what you're going through by explaining this story of mine. I'm just telling you that I've been through some things that are kind of hard, too. And that broke my heart because I, I love this place, and I wanted, I wanted to keep coming here. And, there, and my family is not rich by any means. You know, we live in the swamp of Georgia. We, you know, we don't have $10,000 to shell out like that. So what, you know, what are we going to do? So that night I was, I was laying in my bed, and they didn't tell me this until the Thursday before the Saturday of move-in day. So I had no idea that for whatever reason I owed this money, and I only had a couple days to try and pay it off. So I was laying in bed, and I was absolutely heartbroken. I was mad at God. I was mad at financial aid. I was mad at my parents. I was mad at myself that I'm not a millionaire. I haven't come up with a millionaire idea yet. I was just mad. And my younger brother, his, his name is Ian. They're actually coming in for, for graduation tonight. He was about four or five at the time. Well, maybe not that young, probably about five or six at the time. So he was a cute little booger. And uh, he, he knocks on the door, and I'm like, don't come in. He comes in anyway. You know, little brothers, they won't do that to you. He comes in anyway. He gets in the bed with me. He's like, Bubba. That's what they call me. He's like, Bubba, 
Can I sleep with you? 